have an eye moving over uh, parts of our, our area that is just devastating. And to see what is going to be left down along the coastline is going to be very sobering. Oh my God! The sound of a hurricane rolling in is unmistakable. The house picked up a couple of times and did that pow, 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 pow. August 29th, 2021, Southeast Louisiana held its collective breath as that angry orchestra tune. Hurricane Ida, fierce, slow, and loud as ever, carved through Louisiana. The sun rose on August 30th to a landscape turned inside out. The sounds were replaced by the gritty roar of chainsaws, the hum of generators, and the stories of post-hurricane heartbreak. Grand Isle was the first to face the whipping winds. Boats whirred as survivors assessed the damage. Ida damaged or destroyed every single structure. We were here for Katrina. This was really hit harder than we expected. From there, Ida's path tore up the bayou to Homa. We have nothing here. We have absolutely nothing. The splintered homes told the story. Thousands with no water, no power, no gas, no cell service, no homes. I had 10 payments left on this house. That was it. And it's, it's gone. In Laplace, the ruins reached as high as the rooftops, and stories came from those who feared they wouldn't make it out of their flooded homes alive. We lost a lot out here. Like me and my kids, we don't have nothing, but what you see, my whole house tipped over. Next came the sound of scraping away the mud that would cake Lower Jefferson Parish for months. We can't get emergency equipment, vehicles, um, the island is flooded. But Louisiana never lets a call for help go unanswered. In New Orleans, organizations like Rebuilding Together pitched in to fix homes destroyed by wind and rain. Then different sounds of relief, food, and funding. Strangers dropped off full loads of supplies, food, and hope. This is what makes me feel good coming here. Hot food, and the people love to give you what you need. The recovery has been expensive, slow and difficult. Time has stood still for the thousands still in need of help. But as we reach the one year mark, sounds of normalcy. Louisiana unsinkable, even against Ida's brute power. Good afternoon and thank you for joining us as we mark one year since Hurricane Ida. I'm Devin Bartolotta. Today, we also remember 17 years since Hurricane Katrina as we focus on hope and recovery. Our anchor team is out all across Southeast Louisiana. Chris Franklin is in Lafitte reporting on how Jefferson Parish is rebounding from Ida. And Katie Moore is in Terrebonne bringing us up to date on recovery in the Bayou Parishes. But first, let's head out to Sharice Gibson, who joins us now from Laplace in St. John Parish. Sharice. And Devin, I will tell you, I was here a year ago and this community was barely unrecognizable. That was a month after Hurricane Ida hit this community. There are roofs that were missing off of homes. The floodwaters led to so many high water rescues and not just here in Laplace, but all across St. John Parish. They have people who were displaced from their homes, sent to shelters. There was no communication and it was utter and complete chaos for this community. All in all, 95% of the structures in this community were damaged after Hurricane Ida, and there was no cell service. So you take all of that big combination and you have a disaster. Now, if you were to stand along this highway that I'm on, Airline Highway right now, here we are one year later, and it seems like everything is back to normal. Businesses, they have reopened. I've seen several people shopping in grocery stores at the Home Depot across the street, and people have just been on and on about their lives. But then you think about the the damage that's still in this community, like the building that is behind me right now. That is an unfortunate sign that there, while a lot of us have moved on in our community, there is still a lot of work that needs to be done when it comes to the recovery in the St. John the Baptist Parish. Now, some of that work is already being discussed, of course, like a levee system that's being built by the Coastal Restoration Authority. They are talking about investing almost a billion dollars, millions and millions of dollars to build up those levees to protect areas like St. John the Baptist from 
from those floodwaters from coming on in and causing those high water rescues. But then you run into the other issues that we're seeing, not just here in Louisiana, but across the world, supply chain issues, where people are not able to get access to the supplies that they need to re restore their homes, to make sure that their homes can get fixed. And also think about this, the insurance issues that we've discussed. A lot of people say that one year later, they're still grappling with insurance adjusters, still trying to get all of the things done needed to fix their homes. So obviously this recovery effort one year later, though it may look like it's okay on the surface, things are still trying to pick up and pick up to the pieces so that they can truly get back to some sense of normalcy. Now, they're not just recovering here on the East Bank, but they're also recovering on the West Bank of St. John the Baptist as well. And that is where the Whitney Plantation Museum is located in Wallace, Louisiana. And let me tell you, there was a lot of damage to that plantation the last time I visited. So I went back one year later to meet with Dr. Joy Banner to discuss how they're coming along now. A familiar sound has returned to Whitney Plantation. Tour buses arriving. I was happy to be open in December. I will, I will tell you that um, there was so much that was up in the air, we couldn't, we, we couldn't even predict. I was speechless, I was heartbroken. Dr. Joy Banner says despite the extensive damage experienced at Whitney and to the surrounding Wallace community, the Plantation Museum reopened just months after Hurricane Ida. Every single structure on the site was damaged. And so, I mean, at sometimes we were thinking that we were not, we would literally not be open until a year later. Several structures are still standing, though work continues one year later to fully repair the damage Ida caused. So they're working on the church right now. Oh, they're working on the church. I have not seen the inside of it. And so I have purposefully not walked in there and seen it yet until we walk in there today. Oh my God. Oh, wow. Wow. We almost lost this church. A year later, the church is still closed to visitors. But if restoration continues at this rate, Dr. Banner says it will be open in a matter of weeks. So you just replaced the entire roof? Yeah, and the entire place. roof and everything. This was just an from, from empty the shell. That's the original yeah. church, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it. Wow. So this is it before. This is it right after it had, it was moved and then there was some repair and restoration done at that point. Okay. So it's from a benevolent society. Okay. So it was created by emancipated men and women um, oh, in the 1870s. The extent of history that it has with it, with it and then the amount of time that it has been in existence, again, it's a testimony to great work that it's been able to sustain these storms. Two cabins were knocked down during Ida, but one is in the process of literally being pulled back up. Then, I remember this one leaning backwards. Yes, this one was completely pushed off its foundation, right. which is why it was slanting off. And so um, the preservationist created this um, system mm -hmm. of a, a chain and pulley right. and literally wrenched it back onto its foundation Oh wow! over the course of a, of a month or two. The work continues to repair the damage at some of the cabins, interpreting life from the perspective of the formerly enslaved. Dr. Banner says Whitney wanted those visiting the museum to know what happened. So we had these panels installed when we opened up. At the time, we still had the debris and remnants of the cabins that we lost still mm -hmm. on site. And we knew as visitors came in, they would wonder, so what happened to the cabins? Why have they collapsed? And educating visitors on the impact of hurricanes to not only these historic structures, but the surrounding community as well. Um, and so as a staff, we were thinking about everyone's not only um, their physical safety, but also the psychological safety and comfort of our staff, right. who as local people who work here, um, that have questions constantly about the hurricane, we didn't want that to be traumatic. While most of the debris has gone away and the restoration efforts began on the cabins, Dr. Banner, a Wallace native and descendant of the formerly enslaved at Whitney, says every structure wiped off its slate on the West Bank is a loss to the community. So it's just a, now a memorial, a monument to a family, to a house, to a history that was once there, at least structurally, right. that's not there anymore. Well, that is certainly why Dr. Banner wants these families to be able to return home so that they can rebuild their homes and reclaim the area that they've grown up in so that they can continue to have a community in places like Wallace, Louisiana. 
We, of course, will continue to follow the aftermath of Hurricane Ida one year later on the one year anniversary here in St. John the Baptist. Right now I'm in La Place, but I want to turn it over to my colleague, Katie Moore, who is live for us over in the Bayou Parishes. She is currently in Homa, and Katie, I know that they experienced significant damage in that area as well. Yeah, significant loss is right. And you can see areas where, like you mentioned in Laplace, there are places that are back open, life returning to normal. But there are many, many others where it is just not at this point a year after Hurricane Ida ripped through. Now, if you remember when we were doing live coverage of this storm, as it was moving in, we were all aghast at the fact that this storm somewhat stalled over Terrebonne and Lafouche parishes, sat here and churned for more than four hours. And you can see the impact that that had on these communities just by taking a ride down the highway. When you go down Grand Caillou Road here in Terrebonne Parish, when you go down to the Bayou Parishes further down toward Golden Meadow and places like Galliano in Lafouche Parish, you can see just how much damage Ida did. Now, that not only took a toll on the infrastructure, on the things that are that are here physically, the people's homes, the uh, government services, it took a huge toll on the people as well. And that's something that really uh, I took away with my conversations with people down here today and this week as we've been getting ready uh, for this year look back on what Hurricane Ida did to this region. The people here are unbelievably resi resilient. They are strong. They take care of each other. And I think that we have really seen them pulling themselves up by their bootstraps. And that's evidence in what you can see when you drive around down here. Now, I'm outside of a Save-A-Lot grocery store. It is just devastated and destroyed. And we saw some people putting up some boards over it because, of course, this is the height of hurricane season as well. Now, let's talk a little bit about the status of things here in Terrebonne Parish. Let's start there. This is what it looked like a year ago. We can check out some video from it. 90% of the homes here in Terrebonne were damaged after this storm. That is a huge number of people affected. Still a lot of blue roofs when you drive around. Many people still uh, dealing with insurance issues, dealing with contractors, trying to get them to show up whenever they call. Others have had the gracious help from charity groups that have come in. Now there are still as many as 3,000 people here in Terrebonne Parish in temporary housing. That's those FEMA trailers that you see all along the roads as you drive around. In Lafouche Parish, let's take a look at what it looked like a year ago there. In that parish, 4,000 families are still in temporary housing there. Again, those are those FEMA trailers or some other housing situation that's better than them having to live in hotels and travel down to where they uh, actually live and where they're trying to rebuild their home. So there has been a ton of progress in terms of the people coming back, but there's still a long way to go. And it's something that, you know, I think that comes to mind for all of us when we think about what happened with Hurricane Ida are the stories that we heard from people and the despair that people were going through. And one of the people who told a lot of those stories, let's bring in Mike McDaniel. He's one of our great reporters uh, who's been covering this. And, you know, those stories that you were telling of the loss that people felt and, and just that despair uh, is something that I will never forget. Yeah, it's a lot of raw emotion from a lot of folks and one of them in particular who a lot of folks are resonated yeah. with. She certainly captured a lot of hearts. She certainly captured mine. Her mm -hmm. name is Annette Fontenot down in Montague. I know she's watching right now. Of course, when you talk about the raw emotions, a lot of folks were having them at the time. So it was easy to relate to all that. And just coincidentally, Annette Fontenot called me this morning. We chatted Aww. for a little bit. I'm happy to say she was doing well. Not in her house just yet, still some repairs to be done there as with a lot of houses down there. She, so she's living in a trailer she was able to get from FEMA, got a dog, yeah. a new one, oh, able to wow. bring her some joy. But when she walks outside, as with a lot of folks in her community, it, it's still a lot of heartache out there because when you look at the repairs needing to be done, the homes that are still gone, yeah. a lot of folks are still in need down there. And one thing that she told me on the phone, she said, Mike, don't let them forget about us down here in the Bayou communities. Wow. And I said, you know what, we will, we will. So everybody from like Chauvin to Klondike over into Montague, Miss Annette, and to everybody, I know you're watching, <laughs> we will not forget you, of course. And there's still not. a lot of stuff to be done in the parish. They're still waiting on FEMA dollars to come in. This mm -hmm. parish had to spend a lot of money. The parish has programs up and running to help folks with that disaster recovery and the debris removal from their uh, from their spaces. Right. I think there's still a long way to go. I know that there is some frustration yeah. out there among people who want FEMA to move faster and who want some of these bureaucratic agencies to move faster to get some of those things done. But, you know, one of the things that, you know, comes away from mm -hmm. all of this is not just the despair. I think that storms bring out the best in people at the Always. worst possible times. 
But not only do you have that, you have joy that comes out of it as well. Yeah, and for one case in particular, it would be very easy for that joy to be overshadowed by distress, the stress that everybody was seeing down here in the Bayou Parishes. But for Sean Seavers down in Southern Terrebonne, she's thankful after she looks over it all. That's because her son, Elijah Louvier, was born two days before Hurricane Ida right there in Homa. Now, after his birth at Terrebonne General Health System, doctors realized something. Elijah had jaundice, so that required treatment. That meant mom and baby spent the first days of bonding while riding out a hurricane in the hospital. Now, the storm left the hospital unable to provide medical services, so mom and baby had to be sent home. But caring for Elijah at home was, of course, challenging. And when mom noticed Elijah's skin and eyes were turning yellow, the family packed it up. They headed to Texas to stay with family and try to find medical treatment. Fast forward to now, Elijah celebrated his first birthday just two days ago. And while Hurricane Ida was a dark time for a lot of folks, Elijah's mom lights up when she looks at him. I'm lucky that he's alive. I was scared, desperately scared when we left out of here thinking that he wasn't going to make it at some points because he wouldn't cry, he wouldn't wake up, he wouldn't eat. And now looking at him, I see a fighter. He's determined, but he's got one heck of a birth. Now, getting to Texas, of course, was not easy. And Elijah's mom says thanks to the kindness of a stranger, Katie, they were able to make it. We'll explain all that coming up at 5. Yeah, we look forward to that. You know, you touched on the hospital situation. Yeah. First, happy birthday, Elijah. <laughs> but we touched on that hospital situation. That's one of the really critical needs of emergency services that's still not fully back up and running. I know that they're doing the best they can, but we're going to talk more about the impact on emergency services when we come back to you in just a little while. But for now, we want to send it back to Devin Bartolotta in the studio. All right, Katie and Mike, thank you so much. And as we remember, Ida, we must also mention Hurricane Katrina. Two hurricanes that hit on the same day, 16 years apart. They are now forever tied together. Memorials were held today across the area to mark the 17th anniversary of Hurricane Katrina. For many, Ida's impact brought back some of those old wounds. The stress of hurricane season in general can cause what many call the anniversary effect. So as we honor and remember these important days, we also hope that each and every one of you is taking care of yourself and others. Stay with us, we'll be right back. Welcome back. One year ago, Hurricane Ida was making its way slowly across Louisiana, having made landfall near Port Fouchon as a Category 4 storm. An area hit hard by floods was Lower Jefferson Parish. There is, was water still high in Lafitte days after the storm, and Lafitte is where we find your local weather expert, Chief Meteorologist Chris Franklin. Chris? Yeah, Lower Jefferson, really one of the first areas to begin feeling the impacts of Hurricane Ida and also one of the areas probably hardest hit as the storm approached the coast, eventually making landfall just to the west of Southern Jefferson Parish. And I'm joined now by Parish President Cynthia Lee Chang. And thank you so much. I actually was with you about 11 months ago, and this was a completely different site here in Lafitte. This was a distribution center and kind of a, a different tale today. Tell us a little bit about the recovery down in Lafitte and Lower Jefferson. Yeah, we're here in Lafitte, and if you drove down here, you know, right now, this a year ago, you wouldn't believe how much work has been done to make this community and put it back together. Same thing for Grand Isle, a tremendous amount of work, and thanks to all our partners to really getting us back on our feet. It's been a, it's been a long year, um, but I never would have thought we were this far a year out. So, I mean, is this surprising, the amount of progress that's been made in just the last year, say even 11 months? Uh, from where you thought maybe we would be at this point. Well, if you will recall Lafitte and we always come down here, this whole area was underwater and we couldn't, we had a board by boat on the Lafitte Parkway. Further, normally we board by boat all the way down there and it was the whole, the whole community was underwater. And then when the water subsided, it was nothing but mud. A huge amount of mud in people's homes. So it was so difficult um, to get all that mud removed and homeowners, you would see them just 
pushing the mud out of their houses. So it was a lot, you know, Grand Isle opposite. It looked dry, it looked filled with sand. I mean, we're one parish, but it was very different looking. You know, if you took a picture of it, it looked very different. So yeah, from that perspective, we have, we have gone farther than I ever would have thought we would have in a year. But there are other things that we deal with insurance and we deal with things that really shouldn't be taking a year. Um, so it's, I, I say it's like two, 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 uh, sides of a coin that we look at a year a year later. And there are always those those same problems that we all have to deal with with insurance and all, but what's nice about this part is, is that there's a, a big community that is trying to help the rebuild, and you were just at an event for uh, Habitat for Humanity. Tell us a little about what was going on with that. Yeah, it was a great event to, to mark the one-year anniversary. Habitat for Humanity put a big investment in this community, four and a half million dollars with a commitment to about 40 homes. And so we were at the house of the first homeowners. And the beauty of that is just like anything, you know, when you're down and, and you struggle to build back stronger and that house represents that. It is gonna be a stronger house. It is gonna be able to withstand, I wanna say they said 130 mile per hour winds and the straps on the house and it's elevated. So these people lost their homes, but they will they will rebuild and have a new home and a stronger home. And that's that's the message that we all, that's that's what we can take from this. So still a long way to go, but you're, you're encouraged by the progress that has been made. We have been encouraged all year long. And there are stories like this throughout everywhere, you know, where we're building back stronger. If you look at, you know, our Grand Isle water line, we had a barge water to Grand Isle for three months. Um, we had to rebuild that 32 mile water line to Grand Isle, it's stronger. Uh, we have, you know, alternate plans to get, you know, um, water from, look, Lafouche Parish, um, you know, our water system, our sewer system with up, Upper Jefferson was dealing with that. We were racing against time to get those public work systems back on. We look at funding, you know, redundancy in those systems. So everything is, you know, with an eye to building back stronger. President Chang, thank you so much and good luck for the rest of the recovery and hopefully to a quieter hurricane exactly. season. Exactly. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Hopefully to many quiet hurricane seasons for now. Again, the rebuilding is there. Recovery is evident, but still a long way to go in Lower Jefferson. Live in Lafitte, I'm Chief Meteorologist Chris Franklin. That's an encouraging update. Thank you, Chris. Well, just like Lafitte, there are other places in desperate need of housing, some of them small communities in Louisiana's Bayou parishes, where there are still thousands without a permanent home. We checked in with one parish employee who became an unexpected anchor for the community one year ago today. Yeah, all the big trucks from the military were coming back and forth. All the 35 trucks, long trucks. days. At one point, there were evacuees in the lobby yeah. for about a, a four or five day period. Today. That's how long Roddy LaReal found himself living at the home of Terrebonne Civic Center, managing the Bayou supplies for survival. A whole year. Wow. That's, uh, <laughs> that's it's just hard to wrap your brain around <laughs> thinking about it. A whole year time that's flown for some and stood still for others. How would you characterize how things are right now here? I, I would say improving, but improving in a snail's pace. This is the first time ever I've ever dealt with anything like this. This was L'Oreal then, when the Civic Center became a distribution center. Even with extensive damage to their own homes, he and some other parish employees worked more than a month straight, receiving and unloading 18 wheelers full of supplies and coordinating with the National Guard to get the supplies to communities down the bayou. At the beginning, we were working 20 hours a day at least to try and get everything straight, you know. Before the National Guard arrived, the parish employees and the Civic Center employees, we were we were handling the distribution of whatever we had for three or four days, just us. Did you take away a lesson from all of this? I just think about it a lot. You know, I think about the people that just stepped up to the plate, you know, drove in from California, Chicago, you know. Uh, I think about the girl that filled up her U-Haul and brought it down here. You know, just people that just poured out their hearts and it was just gave and gave and gave. And one year later, his department is still managing the mess. Five of the parish's 17 gymnasiums won't be usable for at least another year. Even some of the outdoor facilities L'Oreal manages are still in need of extensive repair, and it has shortened seasons for lots of young athletes across the parish. And every time he visits one of those facilities, he sees the big picture. There's thousands of people that still in need housing, 
It's a very, very tough situation for a lot of people down in this area. The Civic Center itself sustained at least $2 million in damage, but Roddy says if he gets the call this year, he'll be ready, building on the lessons learned 365 days ago. This is where I'll be. I promise you that I'll be here. If you need to find me, this is where I'll be. Recovery efforts have been moving forward in other parishes too. In St. Charles, around 500 homes were destroyed and 7,000 had major damage. Over 1.5 million cubic yards of debris has been cleared. We're told 80% of the recovery is complete, but we know that last 20% is often the hardest. And in St. James Parish, some residents are still in temporary housing, working to rebuild. Leaders there tell us communication was a big issue after the loss of power and cell service, so they've been encouraging many to get transistor radios. The parish went two weeks without power after Ida. We're now going to head back out to our Sharice Gibson. Sharice, most of the area was without power in the days after the storm due to that catastrophic energy failure. And I know there in St. John where you are, the majority of people didn't have power back until about three weeks after Ida, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Devin, in total, uh, more than 1 million people lost power after the storm. And let me tell you, Intergy wants to prevent that now. They want to spend $15 billion in order to strengthen its grid. I witness investigator David Hammer. He has been following those grid failures in the immediate aftermath of the storm or during the storm and joins us now with where we go from here. As soon as Hurricane Ida's winds died down, we were the first to find this major energy transmission tower crumpled in a rusty heap in Avondale. City tower Council President Helena Moreno arrived soon after. Fallen. Entergy Louisiana CEO Philip May told us the tower had just passed inspection. It's a one of the most robustly engineered towers or structures on the energy system. May said it did not need to be upgraded, but now it has been replaced by this. There is no comparison between what we're seeing here, David, to what you and I saw, but that didn't look super resistant when you compare it to this. Right. Not right. at all. Entergy Vice President Sean Meredith said the new Avondale Tower, tied to another new one across the river in Harahan, went online last week. They're the strongest on the energy system. They cost $48 million to build, and energy claims they can resist 175 mile an hour winds. And a lot of this infrastructure was put in in the 60s, 70s, and 80s when multiple Category 4 storms coming through an area was just not something that we consider feasible at the time, obviously. Wasn't, wasn't now back-to-back -back seasons. We've had to evolve our standards, strengthen them, to withstand those type of events. The collapsed tower was just one of eight transmission lines bringing power in from the regional grid that failed in Hurricane Ida. Most of those high voltage lines were restored in a few days, but then the internal distribution system of street poles and transformers took a week or more to fix. Meredith says a major resilience project over the next decade could cut those outage times in half. And we modeled this through a thousand different scenarios and um, very, you know, very confident in our ability to show a significant improvement in that. And that's a huge benefit to our customers and our communities. Entergy wants to spend $15 billion on a region-wide resilience upgrade. It's applying for a share of $13 billion in federal power grid grants, hoping to offset some of the costs. But it's unclear how much federal money Entergy will get and much of the remaining cost will be passed on to Entergy's customers. We're doing our best to get the shareholders to eat a significant portion of that. Now, of course, as most of it is born on ratepayers. Public Service Commissioner Lambert Boissier is elected to regulate Entergy Louisiana outside the city of New Orleans, including the area where the tower collapsed. He and the rest of the Public Service Commission are still waiting for Entergy to submit its resilience project for approval. Our job is to get us the most reliable power at the cheapest rate, and that is our test for everything that we do. Boissier is up for re-election this fall. He's promising voters who are also seeing much higher power bills that he'll make sure Entergy's upgrades will be worth the cost. And we will continue our special coverage one year in the aftermath of Hurricane Ida on Eyewitness News. We'll be right back.
Thank you so much for staying with us as we mark one year since Hurricane Ida. I'm Devin Bartolotta. Our anchor team is all across Southeast Louisiana this afternoon in areas that were hit hard by the storm, including Chris Franklin in Lower Jefferson Parish and Sharice Gibson covering the progress made in St. John Parish. But first, let's rejoin Katie Moore live from the Bayou Parishes. Hi, Katie. Hi, Devin. Yeah, so many people affected by Hurricane Ida here in Terrebonne and over in Lafouche parishes. You can see behind me this grocery store still looks like Ida hit yesterday. They're just putting up some boards around here probably to keep people out and protect it for hurricane season. But the homes are what are really getting people. There are more than 7,000 people still in temporary housing, 7,000 families rather in Terrebonne and Lafouche parishes. And just to give you some perspective on who those people are, Let's meet Jared Allen. That was on this side. Jared Allen just moved into this house six months before Hurricane Ida tore it in half, literally. We were expecting some shingles gone, but nothing like this. The stairs helped tell his story. High wind and waist deep flood water lifted the house, dropping it two feet over. So we went from four people living in a three bedroom, two and a half bath house to a three bedroom, two bath house with seven people. They lost everything and they were in need of a rescue, a twist of fate. You see, he's the one normally rescuing others. Alan is a South Lafouche firefighter. It's not that we asked for this, it's just, and I mean, we had a place that we could go. So, I mean, that was the best thing. Ida forced 31 firefighters and staff out of their homes. In the daytime, it's an office. At nighttime, the bed comes down. Many were staying at the fire station, still standing when we caught up with them after the storm. I think reality is still setting in. We're shifting more towards we had uh, temporary housing. Now we're trying to find our people permanent housing. And with the insurance skyrocketing, it's going to be hard for our people to rebuild. And most are still not fully home yet. 10 moved away, a big hit for a small, mostly volunteer fire department. This is Fire Central. This is our headquarters building. Did there used to be a roof? There used to be a roof here. Oh, wow. Other stations still look like someone peeled the walls off. In the meantime, Dedon put trucks in all the places the stations once stood. They've had help from firefighters from Florida to Texas, and you can tell they're grateful, but it's hard. I still kind of have, you would call it PTSD. I can still recall that day like it was yesterday. Both the fire department and the staff who call it family have been on a bureaucratic merry-go-round waiting on insurance and FEMA and for Allen, the Small Business Administration, a ride they never asked to get on. How do you keep them going? We're still trying to figure out how we how we doing it. You know, it's uh, I'm not sure. Now, of the 14 fire stations of the 14 fire stations down in South Lafouche, five they think are going to be totaled. It is not hard to find scenes like that in areas all over Lafouche and Terrebonne. Again, look up at this grocery store. There is dangling metal and rebar still where you can just look at it from the road, and that's the case for a lot of businesses and homes. We saw piles of debris on our way over to this grocery store where people were still just beginning their cleanup. So there is a long way to go, although there has been a lot of progress made. And I think people here are so grateful for any and all help that they've been able to get. And now we wanna go back over to Sharice Gibson who has been in Laplace and she's joining us live once again for the latest on that area. Also very hard hit by this storm. Yeah, it certainly is, Katie. You know, a lot of us have moved on and moved on with our lives, but when you look at buildings behind me and even you talking about what's happening in those parishes, it shows that the road to recovery for some is still ongoing. And when we talk about the road to recovery, a lot of that has to do with community and the people within this community. Let me tell you, Meg Ferris, who is joining me right now, has been following a lot of these people who are on the road to recovery. And this is from the very beginning and up until now. And, and they've been entertaining to talk to. They've been high spirited. Where are they a year later? Well, it's interesting, Cherise, because we just happened to stumble across these people when we were out covering the horrible aftermath. One was 
at a food truck just getting food and water. She had nothing. She lost her home. Another was a man cleaning out his home when we drove down a flooded street. And I want you to take a look at the two of these people because we have we have been calling them and keeping in touch with them the whole time. One of them is Janelle LeBranch and the other is Harold DeLay. Now Janelle had lost everything. She was sleeping in her car. Um, she, with her special needs brother, she is um, who she's caring for. Um, we got FEMA to meet up with her that day, and then she's back in her trailer home now. The mold is gone, the roof is repaired, but she still has a long way to go inside her home. Now, Harold DeLay had water damage from holes being torn in his roof, and today he's made progress, new floors, sheetrock, but there's still a whole lot that he has to do. He's living amongst construction. But what touched us is both Harold and Janelle are so grateful just to be in their homes even though they're not finished and they're not complaining, even though there's still a lot that needs to be done. I was fortunate, I thank God for that. You know, I did have enough to kind of like, you know, get my house, uh, you know, all complete. And it's not all the way complete now, but you know, it's about 80%. Didn't know where we were gonna go at night, but thank God, there is a God. Yep, and there's good people in the world. Good people in the world, baby. Now, coming up at 6 o'clock, Sharice, we're going to show you more with them. And we also talked to the parish president, who has some numbers for people to call and who tells us about a big community effort of volunteers who help people. You know, after you did your story, the community effort for Janelle was amazing. We had churches, people wanted to give food and gift cards to her to help and so they to did. see her in a good position. And also, you connected with Harold over the Saints. Is he excited about the new season? He is, uh, yes. Oh, yeah. He had moved his bed into the den so he could, wa you know, right in front of the TV to watch the Saints, yeah. All right, I'd love to see that. Meg, thank you so much for that update, and we will continue our coverage one year after Hurricane Ida devastated this area, and as you can see, the recovery is ongoing. To Katrina, it's the most damaging and intense hurricane to make landfall in the state, leaving many underwater and without power for days. Chris Franklin joins us now from one of the areas that has fought to recover. That is Lower Jefferson Parish. Chris. Hey, Devin. Yeah, I am in Lafitte. And as a matter of fact, I was sent here one month after Ida. And exactly in this location, the Lafitte Fisheries Market, 11 months ago, this was a drop-off spot for supplies for the folks in Lafitte, Jean Lafitte, and down the bayou in the Lower Jefferson Parish. Now, fast forward, there's a concert going on, food being given out by Habitat for Humanity, kind of a celebration of some of the work that they had been doing in Lafitte and in Lower Jefferson Parish to continue the rebuilding process that is ongoing. Now, there is definitely signs of recovery here in Lower Jefferson, but still for some, a long way to go. Our own Paul Murphy had spent much of the day driving along uh, Barataria Bay and has a little bit more detailed look. Parts of the Lafitte area remain frozen in time. Scars from Hurricane Ida dot the landscape one year after one of the most powerful storms to hit Louisiana smacked Lower Jefferson Parish. This is where the water was. And I'm six, I'm six two. We first met Jerry Bruce shortly after the storm. I lost uh, two big sheds. I lost my roof. And some of my steps, if you see, they're still broken, still tore up, but I'm, I'm going to Handle that myself. Ida pushed a wall of water and mud over the seven and a half foot levees here. High winds and heavy rain punished the Lafitte, Barataria, Crown Point communities for 12 hours. We pretty lucky I still have my home. But there's a lot of people down here, like right across the street. They're still struggling. Leslie Anders had to live in his truck for a while after the storm. He's now living in a FEMA trailer. He went, checked the... Uh, House, I'll pull the fish in the uh, place, you know, and it's the water up to our knees. So it was rough. And it's finally they got it cleaned up. So how much longer do you think you're going to be in the trailer? It's going to be a good while. The storm left Fisher Middle and High Schools in Lafitte underwater. The day after, the morning after, I took the P Rog out and went sight sightseeing, and it was devastating water completely over the fence. Like you wouldn't be able to see your car right now. That's how much water was in there. Fisher students are still being taught in temporary classrooms at John Arrett High School in Marrero. Fisher head football coach Tevin Kagan says they're still waiting on word from FEMA to see if his school will be rebuilt. If it comes back over the 50% mark, it'll be uh, 
rebuild. If, if it's under, then we'll be refurbished. Um, but with the, the flood plan, you'd have to put a 12 foot wall around the whole school. So we're hoping that we get raised. Lafitte Mayor Tim Kerner Jr. said despite the storm damage, his town is open for business. Look, we made so much progress in the last year. There's still a lot of work to be done. The bayou still need to be cleared. Um, they still have drainage issues and you still have a lot of people still not in homes uh, and still trying to find out how to put a roof over the head. But we've made a lot of progress. Kerner complains federal funding to bolster hurricane and flood protection has so far eluded the Lafitte area. They have a hundred year protection two and a half miles north of us. They have, uh, they're building levees west of us. They're raising levees east of us and now they're sending uh, levy money south of us. There are a lot of for sale signs along Jean Lafitte Highway, but people like Coach Kagan say, in spite of the risks of future storms, Lafitte is home. We're built different, like <laughs> we're bayou built. So uh, just to be able to handle adversity and keep moving forward, it kind of explains the mindset of this whole community. They have a saying down here along Bayou Barataria, the storm that makes you weak will make you stronger. Lafitte strong. Paul Murphy, Eyewitness News. A graphic that was eye-opening from the post-Ida report from the National Hurricane Center really spells out how much worse it could have actually been for the Lafitte area. Estimates of the storm surge and the height above ground level in the Lafitte area from the National Hurricane Center range about six to nine feet. And you heard Parish President Cynthia Lee Shang earlier talking about how long it took for that water to finally drain and how much mud was left after the storm. Well, had the storm jogged just 15 miles to the east, which would have been basically a wobble in the center of the storm likely would have put another three to five feet in the Lafitte area and all of these areas in Lower Jefferson that are unprotected by a levee system. So Devin, as bad as it could have been from Ida in this part of Jefferson, it actually could have been even worse. Wow. All right. Thank you, Chris, so much. Well, Grand Isle often bears the, br the brunt of hurricanes and Ida brought major damage. Before the storm, 1,400 people lived on the island. Now the population is about half. But posted in the mayor's office is a slogan. As long as there is one grain of sand on Grand Isle, we are not going anywhere. Here's Leslie Spoon on rebuilding efforts. See what happened was unbelievable. Grand Isle was in the eastern eye wall of Hurricane Ida, the worst part of the storm, producing the highest wind and storm surge. The island has about 2,800 total structures. After storm assessment, 460 structures were deemed completely destroyed, and another 187 had major damage. According to City Hall, right now there are 1,411 active permits to rebuild or make repairs. Driving around, you can still see major destruction, but also progress. It took five months after the storm for power to be restored and a boil advisory to be lifted. It took seven months before the island's only school was repaired and kids returned to the classroom. Grand Isle Mayor David Carmadell says for families, just seeing the school bus pull up was a turning point. He's looking at him and saying, there's hope. It means a lot. It does. Carmadell has lived through many storms. Born and raised in Grand Isle, he became a councilman in 1989 and then was elected mayor in 1997. He took us around, taking us to an area that was pummeled by Ida. And you looked at a wall of water that came right through and it went like 12, 13 feet. Starting early September, rocks are set to be delivered to build a wall. For now, there are multiple people in that area living in campers, not chancing rebuilding until they actually see the rocks constructed. Now the beach side of the island is the other area desperately needing resources. I'm talking out of my heart right now is that you're there to protect your people and we don't have time for the red tape. Grand Isle is Louisiana's only inhabited barrier island. Many wonder why people rebuild. Well, for some, they can't afford to leave. For others, it's a place they simply can't live without. Just watching in the Gulf of Mexico and then looking behind you and seeing the sunset and then the sun, sunrise in the morning off the beach. And they said, you know what, we live in paradise. It's beautiful, you know, and, and listen, it, it's, it's worth saving. That was Leslie Spoon reporting. Meanwhile, in Plaquemines Parish, many still want to come back to rebuild, but there have been challenges getting trailers to residents. Parish President Kirk Lapine tells us it's important for people to be close to home so they can work on their homes, and he is still working to make that happen. 
Back now to my colleague Katie Moore in Terrebonne Parish. Katie, at this time last year, this was a big story we know. More than 800 nursing home residents were inside a warehouse in Tangipahoa Parish riding out the storm. Yeah, that's right, Devin. And then four days later, we started to get word from the Louisiana Department of Health that people were dying in that warehouse. And our Erica Ferrando was live outside the warehouse as people were being rescued from that facility. She's reporting tonight on the beginning of a legal battle that will likely stretch on for years over it. There is a breaking story unfolding. Hundreds of nursing home residents who evacuated here. Four of them have died. This wasn't enough room. Living conditions wasn't good. You're seeing people on stretchers, people on wheelchairs. It only would have took one phone call to any family member even. As Hurricane Ida ripped through southeast Louisiana, hundreds of families had comfort knowing their elderly loved ones were safe and evacuated out of harm's way. They weren't. 843 nursing home residents from Orleans, Jefferson, Lafouche, and Terrebonne parishes were packed into a warehouse in Independence. Water leaked in, mattresses were piled on top of each other, and the pictures show the suffering. Four died inside, and about a dozen died in the following days and weeks, at least five, as a result of the conditions inside, the Louisiana Department of Health reported. This is not real. I said, wait a minute, this is not real. Angela Turner's 75-year-old mother, Diana Piquet, was on dialysis. Hoping to leave her in better hands during the storm, she took her to River Palms Nursing and Rehab. They made all these promises to me that they was going to take care of my mother. Then... She said, they had people in a warehouse. I said, what you mean a warehouse? I began to just cry. I had tears rolling down my eyes. I was like, nah, I wouldn't have never did this to my mama. She couldn't track her down for weeks until her mother called from a nurse's phone. She was in Opelousas. I plan to go out there Friday. They called me Thursday and they sent me Zayla, your mama died. She had cardiac arrest. The owner of the seven nursing homes involved, Bob Dean, is now banned from receiving any federal funding, including Medicare, and the state shut down all of his nursing homes. Mr. Bob Dean, not one time he got on TV to apologize to no one. Not one time. In June, Dean was arrested on several charges, including felony counts of cruelty to persons with infirmities, Medicaid fraud, and obstruction of justice. And I forgive him. I do. I really do. Good gosh, I gotta forgive. Turner says she's working with attorney Morris Bart, who is representing 170 residents to sue Dean. But you know what? The money don't mean nothing to me. That kind of money is blood money. Last week, attorneys for more patients and families announced a settlement in several lawsuits filed against the nursing homes and Dean. It includes a payout of nearly $18,000 for each patient in the lawsuit. A judge will decide whether to approve it in October. Is this more about getting justice? And for him to admit, at least admit it, say you sorry. Because a year later, Turner is still fighting through the pain. I feel numb. Each day I pray and ask God to give me strength. And she turns on this song. That's my mama's song. I never meant to cause you any pain. Playing it often in honor and remembrance of her mother. Yeah, rest in peace, mama. Erica Verando, Eyewitness News. I know we will never forget them and what happened in that warehouse. And we will be right back with more coverage of the anniversary of Hurricane Ida after this short break. Resilience, it is a word applied to the people of Louisiana often and a word that honestly, many people are tired of hearing, especially in the years since Hurricane Katrina. But there's no denying that those who live in our area face challenges head on. In the last year, we've learned a lot about growth and hope, and every day people stepped up to help others. It's one of the many reasons why we are proud to call Louisiana home. As we finish out this hour, from my colleagues Katie Moore and Sharice Gibson, we thank you so much for joining us as we remember Ida. Stay with us for the Eyewitness News at 5.